So we're continuing our study now in the Sermon on the Mount. Our title is Growth in Christ Likeness. And we first considered in Matthew 5, verses 1 to 16, nine right attitudes. And now we've been, in the last few weeks, we've been considering nine wrong attitudes. And the first wrong attitude we saw was anger in Matthew 5, verse 21 onwards. And the second wrong attitude we saw was sinful sexual lust, verse 27 onwards, which included divorce. And the third wrong attitude we saw was lying, verse 33 to 37. And the fourth one we saw last Sunday was vengeance, which we saw from verse 38 downwards. And I just want to say one thing in clarification there. There's nothing wrong in asking for justice. We don't take revenge, but it's perfectly proper to ask for justice. And we have the example of Jesus there. In, uh, you know, we need to understand what exactly did Jesus mean when he said, in verse 39, if someone slaps you on one cheek, turn the other. Well, when you look at Jesus' own example, because when he was before the high priest, it says people did slap him. You know, Matthew 18, 22, the officers standing there slapped him saying, is that how you answer the high priest? And Jesus didn't turn the other cheek. You need to understand the spirit in which Jesus spoke those words. If I have spoken wrongly, he told them, testify of the wrong. But if rightly, why do you strike me? That was his reply. So we are not to understand, turn the other cheek in a literal way. When Jesus said, cut off your right hand, he didn't mean it literally. When he said, pluck out your right eye, he didn't mean it literally. We need to understand the figure of speech Jesus was using there. But here we find Jesus asking for justice. If I've spoken wrongfully, sure, give a testimony and say that I had said something wrong, Matthew 18, John 18:23. But if right, why do you strike me? He was asking for justice. But when they just slapped him again and sent him off to the high priest, he just kept quiet. So we see there the example of Christ. You know, we've often said the new covenant letter can kill, just like the old covenant letter. We need to recognize that in the old covenant, it was the letter. In the new covenant, it is the word made flesh. So Jesus is our dictionary. Jesus, the word made flesh, is the one where we see the answer to difficult questions and how to interpret even Jesus' own words. Otherwise, you know, if you take uh, the literal interpretation of Jesus' words, you'll be another new covenant Pharisee, which can be worse than an old covenant Pharisee. I give you that warning because many people pursuing holiness in this day who think they agree with us, in our preaching holiness. And I say, I don't agree with you because your spirit is the spirit of a new covenant Pharisee, which is to me 10 times worse than the old covenant Pharisee. So Jesus is our example. Uh, Now we go on to the fifth wrong attitude from Matthew 5, verse 43 onwards, which I call selectiveness in love. And in the old covenant, it was... Uh, there was a command, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now, there wasn't a command like that. It was, Jesus said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor. That part is a command. But, and hate your enemy, that was something they interpreted from the command, for example, that God told the Israelites to wipe out the Canaanites who were their enemies. So it's from that they imply that statement. But we need to understand why uh, the Lord told them to wipe out the Canaanites. It's because they did not have the ability to overcome idolatry, which was the predominant sin among the Canaanites. And if God was to preserve a pure testimony for his name, through which one day in the nation of Israel, The son of God could come as a man and die for the sins of the earth. That was God's ultimate goal in preparing a nation and giving them his laws. And it took 1,500 years to prepare that nation 
to receive Jesus Christ. It wasn't an easy thing. It was not something the Lord made a nation and the next week he'd send Christ to earth. No, um, they wouldn't have understood what it was all about. And the word of God could not have been proclaimed as it was by the apostles who had been grounded in the law. So we need to understand this, that in order to prepare that nation to receive Christ, God had to give them certain laws and they did not have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. So it was very difficult to keep them from idolatry. And you see how often, in spite of the prophets, in spite of the laws, they kept on going back to adultery again and again and again for a thousand years after the time of Moses. Again and again and again, from 900 years until they went into the Babylonian captivity. They were going back to idols and some prophet would take them out of it again. Some king would take them out again. They'd go back to idolatry. And it was to preserve that nation that the Lord said, you've got to wipe out all these idol worshippers. Otherwise, you, they'll pollute you. You don't have the strength to overcome their, uh, the satanic power that's operating through them. There was no way to overcome Satan in the Old Testament. And on Satan operating through the idol worshippers of that time because the Jewish people did not have the Holy Spirit. So that's why he said the only way is to eliminate. I mean, to use an example, it's like if a man's got an infected leg, infected foot, let's say, which has developed what's called gangrene. Gangrene is something that's so bad that if you don't treat it, it'll destroy your whole body. It'll kill you. So do you know what the doctors do? They cut off that foot. Now, if you saw through a, a, a window in a surgery, a doctor cutting off somebody's foot, you'd think that man hates him. No, he loves him. It's because he loves him that he cuts off that foot so that the rest of the body is, can live. So some, the cutting off of the Canaanites and the killing them was something equivalent to that. Many people who read the Old Testament say, has God changed his mind in the new covenant? And why was he like that? See, when you don't know God, you have all these wrong ideas when you read the Bible. The Bible can be understood only by one who has first received the Holy Spirit and who gets to know God through the Holy Spirit. If you try to understand the Bible intellectually, you will have all types of questions, not only in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament as well. So that is what they were saying, hate the enemy. But in the New Covenant, the Lord was saying, I say to you, love your enemies. Now you can't do that unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit. See, the ultimate answer to keeping the Sermon on the Mount, the commands in the Sermon on the Mount, is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you read the Sermon on the Mount, and you read it like the Law of Moses, you'll just say it's impossible, impossible, impossible. I mean, the Old Covenant law was impossible. Imagine this. And that's why a lot of people say that. And there are, believe it or not, there are some Christians in certain groups, I don't want to mention their names, um, they teach that this is not for Christians. This is for the Jewish people, and it's not for us. They call that the, I call it the Jewish waste paper basket. Whatever you don't like, you put in the Jewish waste paper basket. And that's what somebody else used that expression. Very good expression. But what is the answer to keeping the Sermon on the Mount? I believe it's what finally Jesus said toward, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Ask, Matthew 7, 7 and it'll be given to you. What should you ask for? Good gifts. And what are the good gifts? You compare this with Luke chapter 11, verse 13. It's the Holy Spirit. So when you compare Matthew 7, these first seven verses, no, so verse 7 to 12 with Luke 11 and verse 13, you find that it's the gift of the Holy Spirit that the Lord's telling you to ask for if you want to keep the Sermon on the Mount. Otherwise, you just can't do it. Forget about it. I mean, if you're trying to keep this on your own strength, brother, I'd say don't even try I'll tell you right now, you'll fail. Love your enemies. We have to love every, if you've got 10 enemies and you love nine of them, you have disobeyed the word of God. If there are 10 people who are your enemies, that means not that you're the enemies, they are your enemies. A true Christian has no enemies except the devil. We read in Ephesians 6, verse 10 to 12, we, have, we wrestle not with flesh and blood. We wrestle with principalities and powers and evil forces. If you're a true disciple of Jesus, you have, from your heart, you have no earthly enemy. But hundreds of people may be your enemies because you're a disciple of Christ. And the more fervent your disciple you are, the more you proclaim the truth without compromise, the more enemies you're going to have. Jesus had the maximum number. They hated him so much, they killed him. 
but he loved them all. Every single one of them, he loved them. Even that soldier he came to capture him, who came to capture him when Peter cut off his ear, Jesus immediately picked up that ear and put it back and healed him. What a demonstration of love. And love is what wins people's hearts. And I believe that my conviction is that servant Malchus, whose ear was healed, <laughs> will be in heaven. I can't imagine a man who's being healed by somebody he went to capture and not being convicted by that. And he'll be there in heaven thanking Peter for cutting off his ear. He God turned that for good. And here I am in heaven, Peter, because of how the Lord turned that evil to good. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Can you think of people who've been troubling you, maybe in your office, maybe your relatives, maybe your mother-in-law, maybe some anti-Christian person, um, you know, making life difficult for you in your place of work because you're a witness for Christ? Do you pray for them? Otherwise, you're not obeying God's commands. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Pray for those who persecute you. Pray for those who have troubled you in some way. Pray that they'll be saved. That's the best thing we can, we can pray for. A few months ago, some burglars got into my home that was being locked for some time and in India. And uh, well, they didn't find anything of value there. They looked for gold and uh, cash and there was neither of those there. No jewelry, nothing. My wife never wears jewelry in any case. And they found nothing of value and they were disappointed. But I prayed for them, you know, when I heard that. I said, Lord, I want to see one of them at least. I don't know how many people went in, but at least one of them, I want to, them to be convicted and to be born again. I pray. And many times since that time, these past few months, I prayed that the Lord would bring one of them to Christ in some way, somewhere. The Lord knows who they are. And one of them, oh Lord, lay hold of that person, help me hear the gospel, so that one day when I meet him in heaven, I can em he embraces me and says, you know, Zach, I burgled your house, but because of that, I got saved. Wow, that would thrill my heart. And if I can meet him on earth itself, that'd be even greater. Pray for those who persecute you. And so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. See, this is not the way to become a child of God. No, don't misunderstand. To become a child of God is John 1 verse 12. As many as received him, to them he gave the authority to be children of God, which is the accurate translation as in the NASB. In some other versions, it's not translated correctly. That's the way to be a child of God. We repent of our sins and receive Jesus Christ as our savior who forgives our past sins and we are born from above into God's kingdom. Not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but by the power of God. But a child is a baby, but a child must grow up and become a son. And here it says, if you want to be a son, if you want to grow up, then you must love your enemies and you must pray for those who persecute you and treat nicely those who despitefully use you. Love those who hate you. So the purpose is that we might thereby demonstrate that we are sons of the Father. And in fact, not only demonstrate, that is the proof that you're growing up. Now, if you don't love your enemies, I'm not saying you're not born again. I'm saying you're an immature child. And if you keep on like that, well, I don't know where you'll end up to tell you honestly. You could lose your salvation because hatred is from the devil. An unmerciful attitude is not from God. God is full of mercy. The one place in the universe where there is no mercy is hell. And if you have a lack of mercy towards someone who's treated you badly, face up to it. You got a little bit of hell in your heart. And you know the number of believers who got a little bit of hell in their heart, they got a lack of mercy towards someone who did something wrong to them. There's some husbands who are not even merciful to their wives, and particularly daughters-in-law, mothers-in-law. What a lot of lack of mercy there is among Christians. They've got a little bit of hell in their hearts because hell is the only place in the universe where there's no mercy. And wherever there is a, you know, on, the, on the earth, here and there, you do find mercy here and there, different people, but God's children are here and there. But hell is a place without mercy at all. And heaven is a place full of mercy. So when heaven comes into our heart through the Holy Spirit, he makes us merciful. Now, he doesn't say, we don't pretend that that chap never did me any wrong. No. 
Sure, he did me wrong. We don't pretend that nobody killed Jesus Christ. That wasn't evil. It was very evil. But Jesus was merciful. Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. What, what did they not know? Isn't, doesn't everybody know that to kill a human being is wrong? But they did not know who they were killing. It was the son of God. And when people treat me badly, I say the same thing. Father, they don't know who I am. They don't know I'm a son of God. They don't know what they're doing. They think I'm another human being. I'm not. I'm a child of God. And if you're born again, so are you. And they don't realize that they are poking the eye of God. Like it says in Zechariah chapter 2, verse 5 and verse 8. He who touches you touches the apple of my eye. They don't realize that they are touching the apple of God's eye. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so it, we are to be merciful, love our enemies, do good to those who do evil to you. In the King James Version, this is, an, there is expanded beyond what it says here. Love your enemies, do good to those who um, do evil to you and pray for those who persecute you and despitefully use you. We got to do good to those who hate us. And it says here that because then you're a son of your father, you've got the nature of your father. What is the nature of your father? You know, you, sons are supposed to look like their father, just like physically. You look at somebody and says, hey, boy, he's a spitting image of his father. And that's what people should be saying about us spiritually in our life, the way we live. What a challenge that is. But the people who look at your life and mind should be saying, boy, that's a real image of his father in heaven. Now, how is that? Because he treats evil people in the same way he treats good people. The father, verse 45, makes his son, the S-U-N, to rise on the good and the e evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. There's no difference. Here's an evil farmer who says, there's no God, it's all rubbish and treats people badly and he's very unmerciful to his servants. And here next door to him is a good God-fearing farmer who's kind to everybody. But God sends the rain equally on both farms. That looks a bit unfair, no? Why does God treat that atheist farmer the same way he treats this godly child of his? He makes the sun, you know, a farm needs both sun and rain. And the sun, rain, sun shines equally on both farms. That's, that's God's way. That's God's nature. You cannot make God hate anyone. He judges people, he hates sin, and he will punish one day. He will judge people fairly and in love for the humanity, he will send some people to hell. It's just like even on earth, people put people in prison because they love the rest of human beings. So hell is like an eternal prison. That's all there is to it. So this God loves everyone. And he's equal in his treatment of all. He doesn't have a grudge in his heart against anyone. And that's a wonderful thing to have. He, you see, if God were, for example, let me use an example. Supposing it was not like this. There's another reason why God sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous and makes the sun to rise equally on the good and the evil. If God sent rain and blessings only on righteous people and uh, all the others suffered because they were unrighteous, a lot of people would choose righteousness because they want the blessing upon their farm, because they want the blessing upon their life. If godly people were wealthy and ungodly people were all poor and beggarly, people would choose Christianity for the sake of money. But God doesn't want that. God doesn't want that. So he allows equal distribution of rain and sun and even wealth. Some of the richest people, not some, most of the richest people in the world are not godly Christians at all. Far from them. Far from it. And so the, the, I know there's a false gospel called the prosperity gospel that is being preached today by people who don't know God, who claim themselves to be Christians and claim to be quoting the Bible. And they're mostly quoting Deuteronomy chapter 28 and not Luke chapter 6. There's a lot of difference between quoting Luke 6 and Deuteronomy 28. And they preach that if you, if you follow the Lord, you'll be prosperous. They say, if you pay your tithes, God will bless you. They're going to the Old Testament. In the New Testament, there's not a word about tithe. That's a false gospel. 
because God blesses people equally whether they are good or evil. Do you, did, you under, did you read this clearly? You don't become prosperous by being righteous because the most prosperous people in the world are crooks and ungodly people. But what does that prove? And people who worship false gods and idols are multi-millionaires and billionaires when it's very rare to find a Christian billionaire. That itself disproves this entire prosperity gospel. So God sends his rain equally on the righteous and the unrighteous, makes the sunshine and the good and the evil, because he does not want anyone to come to him because of material blessing or prosperity. I wish everyone in the prosperity gospel preachers would read this and understand it. You be a son of your father, proclaim that truth and be like that. Be good towards people, to everyone. That's how God is. Otherwise, it's foolish to say you're growing up spiritually. You can't say you're growing up spiritually if you're not growing in love for the people who hate you and despise you. And so it's, it's, it's not enough to just hear this right now and say, yeah, yeah, I want to do that. No, we must keep an account. Take an account book like you. Keep an account of your money. And here you say, now, who are the people who have done harm to me? Who are the people who have treated me badly, persecuted me, cheated me, done all types of things wrong to me, borrowed money from me and never returned it? A whole lot of people and did harm to my family, which is worse, treated my son or daughter badly. Maybe your boss in the office or somebody, the teacher in school or something like that, or is your brother-in-law cheated you of your property or your mother-in-law treated you badly. Whatever it is, make a list of it, my brother, sister, if you're serious about your Christianity, and go through that list one by one and ask yourself, do you love them first of all? Do you treat them nicely? Do you have good thoughts about them? Or do you have grudge, a grudge in your heart against them? Well, you're definitely not a mature son or daughter, definitely not. But sometimes I would even question whether you're born again because you're not even trying to keep this command of God. I mean, if you're trying to climb this mountain and you say, I'm still struggling, you're on the right track. Ask God to help you with the Holy Spirit to love every single person who's your enemy. To pray for every single person who's despitefully used you or persecuted you. To do good to every single person who hates you. You may not have the opportunity, but a lot of people, you know, I'm a servant of the Lord and so will I'm a target of the devil. So a lot of people hate me and have done harm to me. And I've really prayed to God, Lord, give me the opportunity to do good to every one of them. And if I get an opportunity, I will do good. If I find them lying on the road, I'll pick them up and take them to hospital and do whatever I can to save their life. I will do whatever I can to help them and their children. I do not hate them. I cannot hate them. I'm not going to be super spiritual and do what Jesus did not do. I'm, the word made flesh is my example. So when it says Jesus loved the Pharisees, of course, he was willing to die for them. But he didn't go visiting the Pharisees' houses with gifts and say, hey, I love you fellas so much. I know you spoke badly about me, but here are some gifts to show you my love. That is superficial nonsense. Jesus did not do that. So don't go beyond uh, try to be more righteous than Jesus himself. Be wise. So to love someone does not mean I have to go around visiting the houses of those who hate me. And because the Bible also says, pursue peace with all men. There's a command like that. Pursue peace with all men. Hebrews chapter 12. And I've discovered through the years, and I'll give you this advice. In some cases, the cases of people who hate you and don't like your face and don't want to see you, the best way to pursue peace with them is avoid meeting them. Try your best to avoid meeting them. Don't visit their homes. Why? Because you want to pursue peace with all men. Because you know they are the quarrelsome type of people. You go there, they'll start a quarrel. So we need to uh, always make Jesus our example to explain these difficult verses. So if you look at a scripture and try to follow that, even this scripture, you can go astray. But the Bible says, let us run the race, not looking at the verses in the Bible, but looking unto Jesus. So when you read a verse in the Bible, look unto Jesus and see how he did it. And then you won't go wrong. These are very important, particularly in these verses, because I found some people who have a wrong way of fulfilling these verses. Bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. 
and they try to be more spiritual than Jesus and make a mess of everything and create more strife. Then Jesus went on to say, if you love only those who love you, verse 46, what reward do you have? Because even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Even the Gentiles do that. So I'm supposed to greet people who want to avoid me. I mean, again, remember what I said earlier, Jesus didn't go around out of his way to shake hands with the Pharisees and to greet them. He, uh, he wasn't avoiding them, but he wasn't particularly keen on going to seeing people who were only out to start a fight or argue. And there are people like that who, you know, only whenever you meet them, they're out to start a fight with you, or argue about some doctrine or something that happened. I avoid them. I mean, I, I would really avoid them. I wouldn't go trying to shake their hands to show my love or anything like that. And I, But I want to be like the S-U-N, then I'm an S-O-N. Jesus said the father makes his S-U-N, son, shine on everybody equally, then you can be an S-O-N. And that's what I want to be. You know, just be warm and good. And the sun doesn't go out of the way to go and shine on people. Just continue shining. So that's how we are to be. And so there's no reward if you do good to those who do good to you. For example, you look at your church and you say, well, I'm such a nice person. I help so many people. Well, who do you help? You help the people who are helping you. Examine your life. You're good to those who are good to you. Somebody did some good to you and you do good to them. You know what it says here? You have no reward, verse 46. Did you do some good to somebody who did good to you? Let me tell you what you got, verse 46. No reward. I'm not saying you shouldn't do that. By all means, let's do good to one another. In fact, Galatians 6 says, let us do good to all men, especially to the household of faith. We have an obligation to bless and help our brothers and sisters. That's, that's a mark of a true Christian. But you shouldn't be doing that for a reward. No. What reward have you got for doing that? Because he says even the sinful people in the world, non-Christian idol worshippers, also help those who help them. But how much do you love those who don't love you? I'm not saying you go and give gifts to them. Let me emphasize that again. And then uh, this verse, verse 48, you are to be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Now, a lot of people misquote this. They say, Jesus says he will make you perfect. Is that what he says here? No, read carefully. You must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. It is not a promised blessing. It's a command to be obeyed. Now, you say, how in the world can I be perfect like God? He's perfect in wisdom and knowledge and power. He's not asking you to be perfect in wisdom and knowledge and power. Always read a verse in its context. You know, when you study the Bible, read a verse in its context. In what context is he saying you must be perfect as your father? It is in your attitude toward people who are unmerciful towards you. Be merciful to them and good to them. And the other way we can know the truth is by comparing scripture with scripture. So this Sermon on the Mount is also repeated in Luke chapter 6. And there we write, read the same thing, Luke 6 and verse 35. Luke 6 and verse 35. This is the Sermon on the Mount again, starting in verse 20. Luke 6, 20 onwards, and all the way up to verse 49. It's a sort of a compressed Sermon on the Mount. What is in three chapters in Matthew is in half a chapter in Luke, Luke 6. And here it's written like this. Verse 31, treat others the way you want others to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that? Verse Luke 6, 33, if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that? If you lend from those you may expect to receive, verse 34, what credit is that? But verse 35, love your enemies, do good and lend expecting nothing in return. And you will be the, your reward will be great. You will be the sons of the Most High. And then this phrase, which we read in Matthew 5 is, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Compare scripture with scripture. Here it is, Luke 6, 36. Be merciful as your father 
in heaven is merciful. So when you compare what is written in Matthew 5 with what is also written in Matthew 6, we realize that the Lord is asking us to be perfect in mercy. Don't go by one scripture. It is written, be perfect as your father is, is heaven is perfect, Matthew 5, 48. It is also written in Luke, 35, Luke 6, 36, be merciful as your father is merciful. So that's the one area where I can be perfect in mercy. I can't be perfect in wisdom and knowledge and power. No, never. Not even in eternity. But I can be perfect in mercy right now. What does that mean? If 10 people hate me, I can love all 10. If I love nine of them, I'm not perfect. What does it mean in an examination to get 10 out of 10 or 100 out of 100? That's perfect. That's a perfect score. You can't beat it. So if you've got 10 enemies and you love all 10, you, you're perfect. If you love only nine of them, you're not perfect. That's all it means. Be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect in its context. I, I want to say something here in passing, and that is don't have this habit that so many Christians have. They come across a difficult verse like that and say, oh, that's impossible. It's not impossible. But you've misunderstood what he's saying. You compare scripture with scripture. What, what it needs in your part is a little diligence to study scripture with scripture to find what exactly it means. I mean, God didn't give me this as a revelation from heaven. No. I just studied the scripture carefully. And when I came to Luke chapter 6 and saw the same thing, hey, I said, this is the same in the Sermon on the Mount. I spent a little time. This is not recent. I'm talking about 55 years ago. I compared scripture with scripture and I said, hey, I'm only supposed to be perfect in mercy. That, that I can understand. If I want to be merciful, I can be perfect in mercy. And I want you to show you also Luke uh, here in 635, how he expresses how the sun shines on the good and the evil. It says in verse 35, the last part, God is kind to ungrateful and evil men. That's a good thing to read. We are surrounded by a world full of evil and ungrateful people. It's a perfect expression of the world. Ungrateful and evil people. There are Christians who are ungrateful. You do good to them and they forget about it. Oh, I've had that experience numerous times. You do such a lot of good to them. And a few years later, they don't even remember it. They forget all about the good you did to them. Ungrateful and evil men. How should I treat them? It says here, God is kind, Luke 6, 35, to ungrateful and evil men. Do you want to be like your heavenly father? Do you want to be a S-O-N of your heavenly father? Then be like the S-U-N who shines on evil, ungrateful people, just like he shines on the grateful people. Okay, that's selectiveness in love, uh, uh, wrong attitude number five. Now we go to the next one, which is, um, chapter 6 and verses 1 to 18. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 18, which is another wrong attitude, which is seeking man's honor. There are three different areas he speaks about here. One is giving, and the other is praying, and the other is fasting. And in all three areas, he speaks about seeking man's honor. Now, again, here, is a, here are areas where we find Christians don't take this seriously at all. For example, in giving, it says here, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Matthew 6, verse 3. Beware of practicing your righteousness before men, verse 1. Now, it's not that, like it says here, the Pharisees blow a trumpet and then uh, give. No, 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 no. We don't do it like that. It's, you need to understand the spirit in which he is saying that in some subtle way, you may want to make it known what you have done. And it's a very subtle way, in a clever way, you want to get honor for the good that you have done. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, there was no law like this. There was no law which said, when you give your money or do good, don't let anybody see it. Don't let anybody know what, I mean, that was God's heart. But when they didn't have the Holy Spirit, he couldn't enforce it. So, you know, for example, when they pay the tithe, 
if they brought their grain or their sheep, which was their tithe, or if they converted it to money and brought money to the, gave it to the Levites in the temple, they could make a big show of it. Hey, fellas, do you see how much I'm giving? God's blessed me immensely, and here is my 10%. In fact, I decided to give 11% today. They can boast about it. And they did not sin because they had obeyed the law, which says pay your 10% and the other offerings as well. But in the new covenant, you can't do that. In the new covenant, it's not a question how much you give, but why you give. What is the motive and whose glory were you seeking? Not only in giving and praying and fasting and everything, you know, this verse in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 is all inclusive. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 31 is an amazing verse. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 31. What, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now eating and drinking is the most ordinary thing that we do every single day of our life. So Jesus took that most ordinary thing and that includes all the other things we do. And he said, do it all for the glory of God. So if I'm doing anything for the glory of myself, for example, to get some glory or honor for myself, even if it is to show, you know, how disciplined I am in my eating, I don't eat much. <laughs> You're sinning. It's good to be disciplined in your eating, but when you begin to show off about it or hint about it or try to get some credit for yourself, you're committing a sin. We need to be what are eating and drinking for the glory of God, not to show what a disciplined person you are. There's a lot of that in, even among Christians. They do certain things. They want to show how disciplined they are and how disciplined they are and how, how much I exercise and how much I do this and how much I do that. To show people, I'm a very disciplined person. Dear brother, dear sister, let God see it. Let God see it. If you do good, try your best. Sometimes we can't avoid it. For example, if you want a large gift, you want to give a large gift for God's word, you have to give it in a check. You can't carry bundles of cash. And naturally, the treasurer of the church will know about it, but that's okay. You didn't do it wanting him to know about it. The point is not whether somebody knew about it. No. The point is, did you want him to know about it? That's the question here. In other words, motive. We will discover in the final day, <clears throat> when we stand before the Lord, that the important question will be not what you did, but why you did it. You know, that's why it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and verse 5, don't judge others before the Lord comes. Because that day he will disclose the motives of people's hearts. That day you will discover why he did this, why he spoke like this, why he gave this testimony like this, and this other thing that he added in his testimony, why he added it, you will discover in that day. It was to get a little credit for himself. That spoiled the whole thing. You know, you can do a very good work and then you do it, uh, advertise it a little bit or do a little bit of it to get some credit for yourself and you've spoiled the whole thing. I call it like making a, a wonderful dish, a very, very tasty dish in India, say a chicken curry or some whatever dish you eat in your country. You make a wonderful tasty dish and then you put a dead lizard inside it and mix it up with it. Ah, you spoiled the whole thing. Why in the world did you have to go and put a dead lizard inside it? It was a first class curry up until then. But you went and put a dead lizard inside it. <clears throat> now nobody can touch it. That's an illustration. You did a wonderful work. You gave sacrificially to the Lord but then you spoiled the whole thing by putting this dead lizard of advertising that fact to others in a subtle way. Even if it's a small lizard, it ruins that dish. Dear brother, sister, 
don't ruin your offering to God by advertising it. That's what Jesus is saying. When you give, don't let your left hand know, Matthew 6, verse 3, what your right hand is doing. Now, think of your left hand and right hand. They don't have any intelligence. The right hand doesn't have any intelligence about knowing what the left hand is doing. The left hand doesn't know what the right hand. It must be referring to the body of Christ. The body of Christ has got a left hand and a right hand. And when we think of the left hand and right hand, those are the ones that work most closely together in the body. We're always doing things together. So it's referring to a brother or sister in the body of Christ who's very close to you. Don't let him know. Don't let her know what you're doing for the Lord. Do it secretly. The devil will tempt you all the time. Come on, let somebody know. Get some credit for it, man. Say no. I'm going to do my best if somebody accidentally discovers it. I'm not even hoping somebody will discover it, but if he discovers it well and good, I'm not going to do it to get any honor. See, in Matthew chapter 5, it's all talking about the inner life, inner attitude, inner attitude, inner attitude, inner attitude. In Matthew chapter 6, is going one step further to motive. What is your motive? Inner life, rather, in the first Matthew 5 is the inner life. And in Matthew 6, it's your motive. So inner life, very important. Motive, just as important. So the Two different things here, Matthew 5 and Matthew chapter 6. So <clears throat> then it goes on to the subject of prayer. When you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't pray in order to be seen by men. See that expression in Matthew 6 verse 5, to be seen by men. Again, what is the important thing in prayer? Before he explains the Lord's prayer, the important thing is motive. Now, I have seen in every Christian group, particularly those who emphasize being filled with the Holy Spirit and charismatic, Pentecostal, I find many of them, they boast a lot about how long they pray. Not only them, I've seen, I've read testimonies of people who, um, it's written in their biographies, they prayed for four hours every day or they got up at such and such a time and prayed and they get a reputation for prayer, for being men of prayer. And uh, when they die, they are described as men of prayer. And uh, I say, how in the world did that happen? You know, I read, I used to read all this as a young Christian about these people who spent two hours in prayer and four hours in prayer. And I tell you, it used to discourage me. It didn't encourage me, it discouraged me. And I read the Bible and I, it never discouraged me. Because the Bible doesn't tell me how many hours Jesus prayed every day. It just tells me, once I, I read that he went into all night to pray, that happened once so be to find out who were going to be his 12 disciples who are going to, you know, establish the church for the next 20 centuries. So definitely he needed to pray all night for that. We don't have such a 20 century influencing um, callings in our life. So I, every Christian doesn't have to pray all night even once. But what, how much did he pray the other times? It doesn't, it said the early morning he went, went to pray when he needed to find God's will about some particular situation. But you have to be very careful in all this. So are you supposed to tell people that you prayed for two hours every day or four hours every day? How would they write that in your biography? Unless you make it aware to people. Well, I, people ask me sometimes, Brother Zach, how long do you pray every day? I said, do you want me to disobey scripture? You are inviting me to disobey scripture. I said, you're inviting me to disobey Matthew 6 verses 5 to, 5 to 8. The Lord says, don't be like them. I'm not going to be like them. So I'm not going to answer your prayer, your, your question. Don't seek for a reputation as a praying man. Uh, don't seek for a reputation in anything. And be holy before the Lord. It says here, it's wonderful to see what you read here, what Jesus says here. When you pray, it's like you're giving. If you're giving in secret, you, your father who sees in secret, verse 4, will reward you. Let your father see in secret how much you gave, sacrificed. He will reward you. And I'll tell you, his reward will not only be in heaven, he'll reward you right now with a blessed, happy life. And a blessed, happy ministry. 
In the same way, when you pray, don't seek to be seen by men because that is their reward. There is no reward after that. He advertised the fact that he was praying two hours every day or one hour every day. He's got his reward already. When he stands before the Lord, the Lord says, well, you never prayed at all. He say, Lord, I prayed one hour every day. Yeah, you got your reward for that in heaven. Beyond that, nothing. Imagine hearing that. A guy who prayed for four hours every day and he advertised it everywhere. And he already got his reward here from people whom he told about it. Finally, he stands before the Lord. And the Lord says, you never prayed at all. He says, oh, yes, Lord, I prayed four hours every day. Oh, you got your reward for that on earth. Nothing now. It says there, they have their reward in full. Did you read that, Matthew 6, 5? There's no reward left in heaven. That's tragic. I'm not saying we pray in order to get a reward. I believe the purpose of prayer is to make us more Christ-like. To me, that is the only reward of prayer for myself. Lord, I want to be more Christ-like. Even when I pray for others, that they'll be healed or... God will bless them. That's what Jesus did. And I say, I want to be like that. I, I want, I'm not even praying for a reward in heaven. I'm praying because that's the nature of my Savior. And the nature of Jesus in me makes me want to pray and never tell people about it. And to pray for those who are needy, etc. So uh, always your motive. If, if Matthew chapter 5 was speaking about the inner life, Matthew 6 is talking about your motive in giving, your motive in praying. Why are you praying is more important than how long you prayed or what you prayed for. It's when the motive is wrong, the whole thing is corrupt. It's a dead lizard in that wonderful dish you cooked. Then he said, when you pray, verse 6, go into your inner room and close your door and pray to your father who is in secret. And your father, who, is in seek, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. So what does that mean? You know, I, I think of the Old Testament tabernacle. In the Old Testament tabernacle, there were three compartments. Well, the tent itself was two compartments, but the whole tabernacle was a big compound surrounded with a curtain. And there was one gate and the others people were outside and the, all the Jewish people could come inside the outer court it was called. Uh, that's a picture outside is the world. Inside you come through the gate, you come to the altar of sacrifice, a picture of Calvary and the labor full of water, picture of water baptism. Calvary and water baptism. And that's where all the believers gathered. Then there are two more compartments, which are covered with a curtain, a tent. In that tent, there was a holy place and a most holy place. So in the outer court, we can say where all the believers, all the Jews were there. But in the holy place, only the priests went. That's a picture of the Lord's servants, the leaders. And in the most holy place, in, the, in those days, nobody could go. God dwelt there. God didn't dwell in the outer court of the holy place. In the most holy place, the fire of God rested over that most holy place. And that was blocked off in the old covenant. It's opened up when Jesus died in the new covenant. So think of these three pictures. So there are people who come into the outer court and they want honor from one another. Whether it's praying or giving. And they want honor from one another. They are sinning. Then there are people who say, I don't want honor from any of these people. I pray and I'll give in secret. I'll pray um, in secret. I'll give in secret. I'll fast in secret. And they enter. They come to the next step. And the most in the holy place, they say, I only seek honor from the leaders. They don't want honor from the believers. They moved one step further into the second compartment. I, what do the leaders think of me? I want them to know. I want the elders in the church to know that I'm praying. I want the elders in the church to know that I'm giving. I want the elders to know where I'm witnessing to people or how many people I brought to Christ. I want the elders to know what I've done for the Lord here and how I went and helped this person there. How I, want to, I don't want the people to know. No, 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 I've gone beyond the outer court. I've come to the holy place. You haven't come to God yet. Those who come through to the most holy place, they're not interested what the other believers think about them. They're not interested what the elders think about them. They're not trying to impress the believers. They're not trying to impress the elders. It's only God. 
That's the true son. You know, the others are babies. I'm not saying you're not a child of God, but you're a baby. You're a baby if you're seeking honor from fellow believers. You're a baby if you're seeking honor from your leaders and elders. The son, S-O-N, is the one who's finished with all this and say, Lord, it's only your approval I seek in my life. I don't seek approval for anybody. And so he says here, uh, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door and pray to your father in secret. And you know, you can do this even when you're praying in public. Almost every believer who prays in public seeks honor from others. If you don't believe me, ask yourself when you pray in public, aren't you very conscious? So-and-so is listening, so-and-so is listening. It's very different from the way you pray when you're alone, kneeling by your bed at home. Very different. Why all that flowery language and all which you never use when you're alone at home? When you're at home and you're praying alone to God, you're crying out in need. But when you're praying in public, you use all this flowery, fanciful language and you're quoting verses and this, that, and the other to impress people. Yeah, there's so much of this. What shall you do? I know, when I started praying in public, I found I was seeking honor. I'd go home, repent. Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't pray to you, I prayed to people. I'd come next time to the meeting and pray in public. Again, I would uh, pray to uh, conscious of people. I'd go home and repent. And it happened again and again for not one or two days, for years. But I said, Lord, I'm going to get through this battle and be an overcomer. This giant of seeking honor in praying in public must be slain and must come under my feet. I'm determined to get this giant of seeking honor in public prayer to come under my feet. And a day came and it happened. It took years. And if you're determined to get this giant under your feet, it'll happen in your life too. It may not happen to, need not happen, uh, take so long for you. It took long for me because nobody taught me what I'm teaching you now. I wish somebody had taught me this when I was converted at the age of 19. So many things which we share today with our CFC churches. I say, Lord, I wish somebody had taught me all this when I was 19 years old. I had to wait till I was 35 to even understand these things. You brothers are so lucky who hear it at a very young age. Battle it from a young age. Get these giants under your feet. And don't, don't get discouraged if you fail. Just go home and repent. It'll be better next time. It'll be a better, better. Gradually, every blow will make that giant weak and one day it'll die. That's, that's the way it is. And so <clears throat> I, I see it like this now. When I pray, I must go into my inner room and close the door and pray. So when I'm praying in public and there are hundreds of people around, in my mind, I shut the door. Why do we close our eyes? We must not only close our eyes because we don't, we close our eyes because we want, don't want to be distracted. There's a door in my mind that I must shut. And in my mind, these people are, they are here, but I'm not seeking their honor. Lord, I've come into the most holy place now. It's only you, and I'm praying to you. There are people listening to me, I know, but I'm before you. I'm praying directly to you in heaven. Otherwise, my brother, sister, you're praying to the walls. Many prayers are not answered because they were not prayed to God. They were prayed to impress people. And you wonder why God never answered it. Even when you pray at home, don't pray to impress your children or your husband or wife. Pray to God. Develop this habit. It'll take time to get through and kill this giant of seeking honor, but it can come. Work on it. Work on it. If you're serious about your Christian life, Jesus said, if you hear my words and you don't do it, you'll build your house on sand. I don't want to build my house on sand. I want to take these words of Jesus and do them. Then I'll build my house on a rock and I'll never shake. And I found through the years, my life becomes more and more unshakable. And that's God's will for you as well. Then one more thing before we close, and that is Matthew 6 and verse 7. When you pray, don't use meaningless repetition as the non-Jewish Gentiles do. Because they think they'll be heard for their many words. Don't be like them because your father knows what you need before you ask him. Matthew 6 verse 7 and 8. So that's the other thing we need to keep in mind. Uh, don't think that God will hear your prayer because you prayed a long time. 
when Elijah and the prophets of Baal met on the top of Mount Carmel, uh, they prayed for a long time. Nothing happened. They rolled and shouted and yelled and all that. And you look at Elijah's prayer. It was less than a minute. Less than one minute. And the fire fell. Don't think God hears you because you prayed for a long time. You prayed all night. Brother, you might as well have gone to sleep. You, you were trying to accomplish a feat. You know, when I was young, as I said, nobody taught me this. So I said, oh, well, I hear other people having all night prayer. You know what I did? I was on a ship and I had a cabin to myself in the ship. So I could be alone and I decided I'm going to pray all night. And I knelt down beside my bed and I started praying. I said, I'm going to get through all night. It was like a marathon I was trying to run. And I, I don't know what time I started, maybe nine o'clock. And I pray and pray and pray and pray. And I said, boy, it must be morning now. Hey, only 9.30, wow. And I continue, 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 continue. What's the time? 10.30. When's this going to finish? I'm determined. I'm on my knees are aching and I'm getting distracted, but I'm keeping awake, keeping awake, keeping awake. Finally, it was six o'clock in the morning. I accomplished it. What did I accomplish? Nothing. Except, yeah, I learned something. But that type of praying is a waste of time. I did learn something, sure. So it wasn't a waste of time in that way. But I, I never tried it again. I said, prayer must come out of a burden. If it doesn't come out of a burden, doesn't come out of love for the Lord, doesn't come out of love for people, you're wasting your time. It's the motive that matters. In everything, it's the motive. So never talk about it. Look at Jesus' life for 30 years. Do you know how much he prayed? Do you think he didn't pray? He prayed a lot, I'm sure. Look at all the good he did in 30 years. Do you think he didn't help people in 30 years? <clears throat> you think he didn't fast in 30 years? I'm sure he did. He prayed, he fasted, he did good. But I turned the pages of the Bible and I don't even read anything about it. In the last verses of John's gospel, he says, there are so many other things that Jesus did, which if it's written here, even the world will not be able to contain so many books. Wow. Lord, what all you did? If you read that verse, the number of things Jesus did, which is not talking about the three and a half years. Most of that is written down. The 30 years of secret. She lived before the father. And we know he did such a lot of good because and never sought his own glory, never advertised it. We still don't know it even today. But we know that the father looked at those 30 years and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. That is baptism. That was a public certificate at the end of 30 years. This son of mine has done a perfect life and never told anybody about it. So when you pray, it says, yeah, don't use meaningless repetition. Don't believe in long prayers. Pray as long as you have a burden. If you have a burden, pray for one hour, pray. But if you have a burden to pray like Elijah only for one minute, that's the end. And the fire can come in one minute. Sure. So I'm not against long prayers. I'm saying pray as long as you have a burden. The Old Testament prophets always spoke about a burden, the burden of the Lord. There are two things essential for prayer. One is burden and the other is faith. If you don't have a burden, it's useless. If you don't have faith, it is useless. So ask God to give you a burden and ask God to give you a faith. Then your prayers will be effective. And if it's one minute or one hour, that's between you and God. But Avoid meaningless repetition. Have you heard people saying, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah? <clears throat> First of all, they don't even know the meaning of hallelujah. It's a Hebrew word which means praise the Lord. You can say it in English. You don't have to say it in Hebrew for God to understand. You can say praise the Lord. It's exactly the same. Hallelujah is not more spiritual than praise the Lord. Hallelujah is saying it in Hebrew and praise the Lord is saying it in English. So it's not... <clears throat> Uh, more advantage to say hallelujah. <clears throat> the only advantage I can see is if you're in the midst of a lot of people who speak different languages from different countries, then they can all understand hallelujah because it's become very common among Christians. So other than that, I don't see any value in it. And don't keep on repeating it. To say praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Jesus said, don't do it. You're actually disobeying Jesus when you say that. When you keep saying hallelujah, 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 you're actually disobeying Jesus. I don't know how many people understand that. <clears throat> I've seen Christians who read these things and they build their house on sand because they hear it and they don't obey it. Well, you heard a lot of things today, my brothers and sisters. Uh, go home, listen to this message again, 
and ask God to help you to have the power of the Holy Spirit to keep it. <clears throat> Humility is the greatest thing of all, seeking God's glory alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you will help us to remember all that we've heard, that the Holy Spirit will be able to apply all this to our life and speak to each of us individually today, tomorrow, this year, and next year, until you come about the areas where we need to cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.